It's a conspiracy. <laughs> So we've got the Greeks and the Romans, <laughs> who've got gods and goddesses to explain just about everything that's beyond their understanding. Earthquakes, infertility, thunder, even love. The ebb and flow of the ocean was attributed to the shifting moods of Poseidon. Infertility was caused by falling out of favor with the fertility goddess Juno. Pandemic disease was a punishment, a plague sent by an angry god. Now this kind of spirituality is known as the god of the gaps. When the ancients experienced gaps in their understanding of the world around them, they filled those gaps with God. Over time, however, the progress of science began removing those gaps, and the pantheon of gods and goddesses began to shrink. For example, we now understand the science of thunder and lightning, and the, thunder, uh, the god Thor has been banished as a foolish myth of an ignorant time. Mankind no longer turns to God for answers as to why the skies drop hail or why plagues spread. Science has answered those questions. Ironically, we turn to God for the answers to a handful of existential questions that science has never been able to answer. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And what happens when we die? And in asking these questions, we realize that we, just like our ancient ancestors, still worship the God of the gaps. We still call upon God to fill the gaps in our understanding of the human experience. Every day we have a greater scientific understanding of the world around us and it becomes more difficult to blindly accept ancient beliefs without questioning them, even if we desperately want to. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we become modern, science-minded people without losing our faith? Now, this very question was addressed by, um, addressed by the Vatican's Carmelengo in a speech to the College of Cardinals. Uh, unfortunately, this was not in real life. This was in the uh, first draft of a novel I wrote called Angels and Demons. Um, I wish it had been in real life. Uh, the Carmelengo, standing before the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel, speaks out on this age-old battle between science and religion, and this is what he said. Science proclaims that our world is a meaningless speck in the grand scheme and that life is some kind of cosmic accident. Science tells us we exist merely by chance because Earth happens to be just the right distance from just the right star with just the right blend of certain elements. Science tells us that humankind is nothing but the lucky winner of a mindless process called evolution, a cold, self-serving progression that recombines D DNA over time. Astrophysicists tell us that even the slightest change in the force of gravity would have rendered a much different universe. If the gravitational constant had been a fraction stronger, our universe would have collapsed in on itself. If it had been a fraction weaker, our universe would have dissipated into an endless amorphous cloud of dust. But the gravitational constant was precisely what it needed to be to create our magnificent sea of heavenly bodies. And yet somehow, Science fails to see God's hand in this. Is it really so much easier to believe that we simply chose the right card from an infinite deck? Have we become so spiritually bankrupt that we'd rather believe in mathematical implausibility than in a power greater than ourselves? For, for me personally, uh, for me personally, there, there really is no experience that better fuses the mysteries of science and religion than that of lying out beneath a star-filled infinite universe and staring up at the heavens. And regardless of our particular religious beliefs, or even our lack thereof, every one of us in this room has had one of those private moments where we stare up at the starlit heavens and we say, whatever that is, it's bigger than my understanding. It's beyond my grasp. And in that moment, each of us senses God, whatever that may be for each of us. And in these mystical moments, our specific culture and faith are totally irrelevant. Whether we're staring up at the stars, or holding a newborn child, or falling in love, or quietly fearing our own mortality, these are universal experiences. So here's the question. 
If all of us have spiritual experiences that are similar, why are our religions so different? And the answer is, they are not. The differences in religion arrive when we start using language, when we try to record and share our experiences, when we start reading metaphors as history, when we attempt to describe a mystical landscape in terms of a concrete architecture. By attempting to rigidly classify ethereal concepts like God, we end up debating vocabulary and semantics while we entirely miss the obvious. And that is that all of our world religions have at their core the same basic human truths. Kindness is better than cruelty. Creation is better than destruction. And love is better than hate. These ideas, so powerful in their simplicity, are deeply entrenched in the teachings of Hinduism and they were also at the core of my upbringing. I had the great fortune of growing up on the campus of a well-known American boarding school called Phillips Exeter Academy, where my father taught math. Uh, we lived in a dormitory. You know, I, we had a, a lot of 16 through 20-year-olds from all over the world living there in this dormitory. Um, I had babysitters of every color, religion, and cultural background imaginable. Uh, the church at the academy held services for Christians, Hindus, Muslim, Jews, and we even had an agnostic discussion group, if you can imagine that. Um, so this was normal to me growing up. And I realized that to grow up in a world without prejudice, racism, or religious intolerance is an enormous privilege, a privilege which sadly most people do not enjoy. And I got a taste of the alternative when I wrote a book called The Da Vinci Code. <laughs> and experienced a little backlash. In that novel, fictional characters debate a very simple question. What would it mean for Christianity if Jesus Christ were not literally the Son of God, if he were a mortal prophet, if he were simply a man? Now, not everyone thought that was a great question to be asking. <laughs> and about a year after The Da Vinci Code came out, a priest walked up to me on the streets of Boston and he proclaimed in a very loud voice, Mr. Brown, I did not care for your novel one bit. <laughs> and before I could figure out how to respond, this priest broke into a big smile and he added, but I just had to come over here and thank you. He went on to say, every Wednesday night for the past 10 years that he'd held Bible study in his office and every Wednesday night he'd had the same eight people show up. The previous month he had printed out the usual notice in the church bulletin reminding people of Bible study and noting that this week's topic was the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> and he said, guess what? I had hundreds of people show up for Bible study. So, yeah. Yeah. He said that talking about a thriller wasn't really how he imagined it happening, but he was grateful for the dialogue. Uh, I'm a big believer in dialogue, and I believe that it is our duty as reflective people to spark dialogue, and this is one of the primary reasons that I write. People often ask me what it's like to write these novels, and as any author can tell you, writing can be a very isolating pursuit. It is challenging and sometimes a very lonely way to spend your life. Uh, I'm guessing we have a lot of writers here. Can you ra raise your hands? Oh, a bunch of you. Okay. Well, I can't see you in the spotlight, but I'm, I'm assuming you look depressed and tormented and <laughs> miserable. Yeah, okay. Um, George Orwell uh, said this about writing. Writing a book is an exhausting struggle, like a bout with a long and serious illness. Another famous author asked um, if he enjoyed writing, and he cleverly answered, I enjoy having written. Franz Kafka goes a bit more direct. He said, writing is utter solitude, the descent into the cold abyss of oneself. So, I'm not trying to discourage any writers in the audience, by the way. Um, writing can be a little solitary, schizophrenic, filled with demons and doubts, um, accompanied by the incessant voices of your characters, often drowning out the voices of the real people in your life, uh, which can be a little distracting. Writers become... I should say some writers become, I'm sure you're very normal when you're writing. <laughs> uh, some writers become strange people. Uh, and in light of this, I'd like to share with you the single truest statement I've ever heard about writers, and it is this. 
There could be only one existence more miserable than being a writer, and that is being married to a writer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, my wife Blythe sends her love to all of you. She could not be here tonight. Um, she tolerates me with remarkable grace, actually. Uh, in addition to being my number one researcher and my first pass editor, she is a perpetually grounding force in my life. And, and grounding is kind of a euphemism for humbling. <laughs> in Blythe's world, the New York Times bestseller list has no relevance whatsoever to who empties the trash or, or you know, it empties the dishwasher, takes out the trash, that sort of thing. Uh, it's always me. It doesn't matter where I am on the list. <laughs> At the height of the Da Vinci Code's popularity, a major news magazine ran the cover story does Christianity have anything to fear from Dan Brown? <laughs> so, feeling quite influential, I put the magazine on Blythe's desk so she could see just how important a man she had married. <laughs> Later that day, yeah, she laughed too, actually. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Later that day, the magazine was back on my desk with one passage highlighted. It was a quote from a prominent British priest who responded to the question on the cover with the following statement. Christian theology has survived the writings of Galileo and the writings of Darwin. Surely it will survive the writings of some novelist from America. <laughs> Which it seems to have done perfectly well. Um, how many of you have seen the movie version of The Da Vinci Code? Oh, a lot, wow, a lot of you, okay, yeah. So, when... Columbia Pictures, Sony Pictures came to me and uh, asked about making the movie. I really wasn't sure at first if I wanted to make a movie. Uh, for me, the magic of a book lies in its ability to be different things to different people. For example, yeah, a lot of book lovers here. You understand that. So this is going to be my little pitch for, for books. I, I love movies. I go to the movies. But just think about this for a, sec a second. When children first began reading Harry Potter, Every single child created in his or her mind a unique mental image of Harry and of these magical locations. However, as soon as the movie came out, every single reader from that moment on now pictured Harry in the exact same way as the actor. And so, with respect to The Da Vinci Code, I thought maybe I'd wait until I finished the Robert Langdon series, let the books breathe for a while, and then make them into movies. And I, I, should, um, I should add that 